Good afternoon. Um, my name is Isabel Hao. I'm an investment partner uh, with the Omidyar Network, the philanthropic investment firm of Pierre Omidyar and his wife Pam. And we invest in uh, two generation strategies focused on early childhood on one hand and on the other hand, um, adult learners, the parents in both young children's lives to ensure that um, uh, both parents have post-secondary success and economic mobility. So it's my pleasure to um, be joined by a phenomenal group of, uh, of folks here um, that represent very diverse, diverse perspectives. So we have another founder, we have a school district leader, we have an entrepreneur, and we have a non-profit entrepreneur. So, um, and the topic is uh, obviously related to bending the arc of uh, human potential, specifically in pre-K-12, and how do we prepare students for the future? So I will start by hacking the title, um, because pre-K-12 I think is largely insufficient, and I would suggest that we call it birth to K-12, and in, as opposed to pre-K-12. So, let me hack the title already. Um, um, but before we, um, we get to the how do we prepare students for the future, let me um, ask each one of the panelists, what are we preparing both students for and what, what are their perspectives relative to what is needed for the future of jobs? So from um, our perspective at the foundation, this is new work for us in terms of thinking about workforce development very specifically. Um, we've been very much grounded in like completion work and now we're thinking and asking ourselves that question, to what end, right? Are young people ready for what's next? And so for us, when we think about the future, I mean, it's really about looking at the disparities that exist. Specifically, our target audience are black, Latino, and low-income young people. And so what we've seen is that um, that population specifically is disproportionately represented in upwardly mobile opportunities. And so when we look back, we're like, what opportunities did they have? What opportunities were presented? And what opportunities were not presented to them early on? And so for us, when we think about, we don't know what the future is going to look like. Um, so we don't have a state of play in terms of this is the future state and this is the future of work. What we do know is that there's a skills gap. What we do know is that the most marginalized population is underrepresented now and will just continuously be disproportionately um, represented in those opportunities. So for us, it's really about what do we need to do now between the age of 14 and 24, 25 of age to prepare them to launch um, a career that can put them on a path to upward mobility. So we're not being futurists or foresight thinkers in that sense, we're simply thinking about what do we need to do in changing the state of learning and changing the input so that they're ready to launch careers and they understand the importance of lifelong learning so that then they can navigate a changing workforce because it's going to continue to change over their life lifetime. Good afternoon. I would say um, I would hack into the title a little bit more and say beyond pre-K through the 12th grade. What we're really looking for are preparing our students to be lifelong learners so that they have the ability to be agile, they have the ability to adapt and shift as, as our future changes and the expectations and the supply and demand are responsive versus a supply chain that is completely disconnected from the demand chain. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Scheuer, no red ink. Uh, I think one of the areas that uh, prior panelists have alluded to uh, where we need to uh, do a lot better job is helping students not just to think better, but also to communicate that thinking. Um, and to use exercises that they do, whether it's reading or writing, as a process of metacognition to kind of stress test uh, their own ideas and their own thinking uh, so that the ideas that they communicate are more robust, uh, better battle tested, um, and have more substance. How many ways can we hack this title? Um, I, my name is Carmita Saman. It is really appropriate that I'm at the end of this because I'm on the continuum. My work, I founded an organization and we focus on adult learning. Uh, the, we run a leadership institute specifically for the adults who are supporting hundreds of thousands of students across the country. And I would say that unfortunately we have this notion that adults have done the work themselves 
that we are seeking to have young people do. And what we have found is that if we don't invest in those who are seeking to influence, change um, systems and entire ecosystems that have underserved so many for so long, we are missing a key part of that equation. So I'd love to dive into that a little bit longer, but I'll wait. Can I, can I just, I just, so, so many people have said this today, but I just wanna punctuate it. I think if we keep, continue to have a single generation mindset, we will fail to deliver on a lifelong learner um, future. Uh, because at the end of the day, what we're asking, whether it's our educators, our parents, or our influencers with our students to do, they also are, are learning how to do it at the same time. And if we separate or silo those two, I, I think we lose the capital that is built in growing together, and we isolate the next generation of students. Thank you. Um, Carmita, I would love to turn to you. Um, I had a, um, a very interesting experience over the past few days. I was with um, 15 top venture capitalists um, in, um, in Colorado. And uh, out of this group of 15 folks, three of them had their children in homeschooling. Uh, actually, real stats were two of them were already homeschooled and the third one was thinking about uh, homeschooling their child. Um, so there are lots of underpinning questions here. Um, uh, one, some that, that have to do with equity, some that have to do with the quality of our, our school systems, um, and, and many others. Uh, but Carmen, I know that you are actively working on the educator front and what is the role of educators in this future of learning that you are, that you are building? Yeah. I think it's critical. I mean, to the point, we, we ultimately, we sit in rooms like this and we talk about innovation and creativity and we operate as if things somehow go from the top of the mountain and, and filter down to the young people through osmosis. And unfortunately, that's not reality. Um, the, you know, and, and in our, I'll bring it to, to our work and what we're discovering in Surge. So I, I founded Surge in 2014 specifically to address a dearth of representation in education. So a lot of folks saw that as, oh, okay, this is this leadership institute that's specifically for um, folks of color and to, to increase that pipeline of leadership. But what we found, I think, is so, um, can be so impactful for the entire ecosystem, which is, uh, many of our young people, uh, our young adults, so we, our average age is uh, sort of 29 to, to 32, um, these individuals have been solid individual contributors. They have learned how to play the game. They know the basic hard skills. Uh, but what no one has taught them are the skills that are required to influence and move systems. So when we think about all the rage in SEL with young people, we are relying on many adults who themselves have not ever been rewarded for curiosity and risk taking, who themselves have actually never been, uh, have developed the tools around agency and self-efficacy. So I believe that it is really imperative to this multi-generational approach for us, and again, it's an entire continuum. We are a part of that continuum, but it's a part that's oft ignored, and I think that's a mistake. Thank you. Jeff and Hannah, uh, you both interact on a daily basis with school district. You were a, sc a school district leader. What would you like, what is the one thing you would like to see school districts do more of to prepare children for the future? And maybe what is the one thing you would like them to, to do less of? Sure, yeah, well I think you make a great point that um, teachers can have a, a far more uh, strategic role in terms of helping, um, helping the communities that they're overseeing uh, to, uh, to educate. Teachers are the CEOs of their classrooms, right? Uh, and a lot of what teachers spend their time on uh, are uh, logistics, um, and getting kind of bogged down in, um, in details that, uh, that they would be far better off and their students would be far better off if they were able to delegate, if they were able to get more help uh, from software and more help from a variety of, of systems and resources. Uh, so I think a lot of teachers, and when I was in the classroom, uh, adopt a you know, loco parentis mindset. Uh, parenting is hard. Kids uh, need somebody to sit with them and talk through them about you plagiarized your paper and... Uh, 
what, what, how can we turn this into a, into a learning moment, right? And that is not something that software is going to be very good at helping kids do. Uh, teachers are professional relationship builders. They're, they're nurturers. They understand what kids need emotionally and cognitively to, to develop and grow. Um, and so the person overseeing that entire classroom environment is kind of an expert in, in the dynamics of, of children. Um, so uh, one thing that I would really love is for teachers to have more support um, so that they have the time to play that role that is like kind of the critical thing that only teachers can do. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, in terms of what they would do, I, it's kind of a both less and more, right? Uh, less, less time bogged down in, uh, in compliance and, and logistics and more, t more time thinking strategically about how do I deploy uh, the students in my classroom, the resources I have in my classroom so that it can be as strong a learning environment as possible. So I'm gonna say something not very sexy. I would just say this. At the end of the day, we're asking our education systems to do something the systems don't incentivize. And at, at the end of the day, I, I think until we change our systems, we're not, we're not going to get a, a whole, wholly different outcome. We'll see peripheral d changes, incredible things we hear about today. Just want to be clear, I love being here. This is probably the third kind of gathering I've been where it's a very entrepreneurial space, um, which is exciting. And we can start to think this is the, the norm. This is not the norm. Um, not to be discouraging. Um, th there'll be a place in time, I'm sure. But until we shift our systems, let me just uh, whether it's funding, which is all about butts and chairs, not outcomes at the end of the day, until we shift our, our how we, I mean grades, elementary, middle, post-secondary, they're all siloed. And then we want lifelong learners and we want the end game of employability. And we've set up our systems to, to incentivize, encourage, and create an, a wholly different outcome. So I think what I would love to see change is, the, is our, how we, our systems and what they incentivize. Um, what I would love to see, this is cheating, less of is the paradigm we have. The paradigm that says, and, and we, listen, if we all raise our hand and you think about the, your children or the children you know, and you say, what do you want for them? And, and you say, and we would have this great conversation about, you know, it's not all college for everyone. <coughs> but if we ask everyone in this room what they hope for their child, I'm willing to put some money, there's a few heavy, heavy risk takers, but I'm willing to put some money on the fact that most of us would say, well, my child's gonna go to college, it's the other ones that we should be thinking about something different. And so I also think it's not just a systems issue, it's a, a paradigm shift, so less of the current paradigm and more of a new paradigm, which takes a huge investment in the social capital and conversation. Can I, can I follow up on this? What do you mean by new incentives and new paradigm? Uh, can you maybe expand outside of this continuum that you have spoken about? So, I mean, you said it. At the, uh, when we think about our systems today and what they generally reward, they generally reward compliance. They don't generally reward outcomes or the end game. Um, our systems generally reward, for example, we, we pay, our funding is based on how many kids are in the classroom at a certain date and time, by the way, not for the whole year. It's, a, it's really, in fact, districts send out notices to parents about the important day their child should show up. It's in the middle of October, usually. It's called headcount day. And it's the day that we take account of how many kids are in our classroom because that's how we get paid. It, I get it, I, we've, got, we've got to have some way to do this, but until we shift into, it's not just about the compliance of being there, but it's about the opportunity of what being there represents, we're gonna have a hard time making the shift into the kinds of conversations we're having today across the country, not in pockets that excite us. Isabel, can I build on that for one second? Because I think there's an important connection to what Katie said earlier. So we, we sat here and listened to her talk about the traits necessary for entrepreneurs. It was hustle. It was curiosity. It was resilience. It was the ability to not get straight A's and, and show up the next day and keep doing it again. 
And these are all things, just to build on this point, that we are not incentivizing. We are not incentivizing with the young people nor the adults who are shaping and grooming those young people. So we expect them to magically, when they come out of that system, to have these skills. And, and many of our young people are learning these things elsewhere, right? They're learning them in out of school time programming. They're learning them through their churches or their places of worship and those sorts of things. But for those who aren't, they are starting a game after, you know, in the third quarter or whatever sort of rough analogy you want to use. But, um, but, but I just, I think, we, I think we often have these conversations in a very siloed way and don't acknowledge that in conversations where we're talking about these systems, our young people, what they need, what we're preparing them for, we're having one conversation. But in the bright, shiny, innovation tech world, when we talk about what we want to see in those that we feel are worthy of investment, they aren't the same people. And that's a that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, Isa, what are you, you know you had you have a lot of passion around social capital, and to bridge to Carmita's point, um, how how do you um, think about the schools after schools? Uh, how do we you know this qu broad question about how do we prepare kids for the future, um, um, and and the place of different elements I in it. Yeah, so as we think about um, our work specifically, like, so we had an opportunity to look at, like, what is the soft skills gap? What is the technical skills gap? Um, you know, what are, I mean, just look across, what are the credentials of value? So just looking across the board in terms of what do young people need? What do people need just to launch a career that leads to upward mobility? And so we've identified um, four things, specifically as we call, like, critical assets. And so, one, it's credentials aligned to labor market value, right? And that looks different from place to place, context to context. Another one is agency, right? Because there's one thing to have informed information, but to do something with that information, right? Knowing how to activate on agency. Um, there's also having the skills, right? So there's technical skills and soft skills, but soft skills is not something you develop in a, a moment in time, right? You develop soft skills, critical thinking, problem solving, communications, collaboration, curiosity. I mean, over time, you develop these things and you need to be in spaces where you can practice these in real life work-based learning experiences. Um, but lastly is the social capital. And the reality is a young person can have all of, the thing, all of the other things in terms of credentials and skills and the agency, but it, if they don't have access to people who can open doors for them and networks that can create opportunities for them, it's to, like, to what end, right? And so many young people don't have access um, to adults who can actually open doors and create opportunities for them um, or you know, guide them along opportunities. And so for us, what we're starting to do now is really dig into that social capital, understanding weak ties versus strong ties, understanding the different types of relationships that are important along the human development and youth development spectrum. You know, how do young people socialize? Who do they socialize with? Who are the adults in their lives every day um, that have an impact and um, not only serve as mentors and coaches, but also accountability partners. And so for us, it's really like social capital for us is what's game changing in this space is because there's a lot of other organizations looking at those other things, but not enough organizations looking at the social capital piece and how do we build um, social capital and how do we help young people think about network building, right? And so you think about everyone in this space, you're in this space either because it's connected to your work, it's you connected to the network in some way. In some way, this is a highly curated room that was invite only. Right, so many of our young people are not invited to spaces, so they're not in spaces where they're making decisions about what's happening in their lives, and yet, and they're being kept out of opportunities. Yeah, let me let me push you on this for a moment. Um, uh, you, you, some of some of you may have read this recent um, Atlantic uh, article that spoke about. Uh, I think the title was "Intensive Parenting is Now the Norm." And I think it's a norm in higher income settings, um, or it's becoming the, the, the norm in middle class, higher income settings. Um, how do we reconcile this notion of social capital with um, greater and greater inequities 
and this trend that is definitely here uh, around this uh, this um, this very intensive parenting um, and heli helicopter parenting that 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 uh, that is now uh, becoming the norm in in many communities. I can just quickly respond. So, I mean, one thing that's super important is young people having exposure. Um, to different adults and having a lot of different adult allies in their life, so we can't put all the responsibility on their parents. I mean, just given the, given the circumstances, right? So oftentimes what they're exposed to immediately and our young people, especially the ones that we're targeting, um, those are the paths they wanna pursue because that's all they know, right? And that's the ones that they're most familiar with. So. Um, as Carmina mentioned, youth development agencies. There's a lot of other organizations outside of the school environment. There's a lot of other adults in a young person's life outside of their parents or guardians um, that can be engaged in very appropriate and meaningful ways to help them explore what's out there and create opportunities through job shadowing, through visits, um, and then as they get older, through meaning more, much more meaningful um, experiences, but I think there's a there's a lot placed on their immediate circle and not really thinking much broader and thinking about what's the ecosystem in which they exist, who are those folks that touch them directly and indirectly, and how do we then empower them to expose them to the potential of what's next? Can I uh, just a tag team with that? I'm a big believer in accountability and and responsibility. Full stop. Next sentence. I think if we're looking for the education system to solve the social capital gap, we're gonna forever be disappointed. And it's not because there, there isn't and shouldn't be a, a continual push and a blurring of the lines around the interface between opportunities to develop and build social capital for our students and our young people. I, I mean, if we do a hard line silo, we're gonna miss the boat too. Um, but, and I also am just struck by, I know lots of, the, what was the trillion dollar program that needed to be funded today. Um, I will, I did spend some time with the U.S. Department of Education. We do, we do do big grants every now and then that have really, the return on investment's been super high. There's a little sarcasm in that. Um, I would just say this, at the end of the day, um, the idea that we're going to create a system or a program of social capital, I think is a, a flawed paradigm. And too often we're looking at education as a system, or we want to create a new program to solve a put the you know put our finger in the in the in the gap so to speak. And it's not a finger issue; it is a permeable, lifelong issue. And once again, as long as we're siloing, we're going to miss the full opportunity, and we'll just see these bright lights here and there instead of a, a holistic shift in, in um, our outcomes. I, I, I want to come back to this particular article. We didn't talk about this on our prep call, but it's like you just lobbed it up there. I, um, one of the issues that I had with the article is that we uh, ignore both the, the assets and deficits associated with this type of parenting, right? So if you look at the flip side of young people who are growing up in lower income, uh, dual working family households, they are seen to actually have be much more prepared for things that require independence resourcefulness, like we can go down the building blocks, um, but we often just focus on what they are lacking. And I think there's an opportunity in conversations like this for us to say, this is not a binary, th this need not be a binary narrative. We can actually acknowledge the, the innate assets that exist for all of our young people, no matter what kind of helicopter parents they have or parents who have to work and those sorts of things. But I think to the point, we can try to build systems, systemic supports around them, um, whether that's in formal education settings, out of school time settings, youth develop, what, whatever. But oftentimes we come into conversations like this, reading articles like that and assuming that that is the answer and we instead we say how do we actually replicate that through the system when that is not necessarily the case so I I we could talk about that a lot <laughs> because I personally don't think that more helicopter parenting for poor kids is necessarily the right way to go yeah and I'd agree that but I would put uh, s resolving social inequities around um, uh, social networks and 
uh, habits of mind that we want to engender as, I'd, I'd put them as very separate, very separate uh, things. Uh, in terms of what we can do from a curriculum perspective to help students learn better, I think a lot of that uh, comes down to moving, it's a pedagogical gap and thinking about learning as a process of induction versus deduction. Uh, it's one thing to tell students, hey, a good essay has these components, and this is how you're supposed to write because this is what works well, versus giving students some essays to read and asking which introductions grabbed your interest the most and why, and can you make a good case for why this introduction is more compelling than this? Um, and whether it's math or reading or writing, regardless of the subject area, uh, getting kids engaged in the material, uh, interested in taking a stance, uh, and kind of trying to defend claims and ideas that they have on their own. I, mean, I think if you start with attention-grabbing uh, material, uh, then we're uh, much more likely to be successful in uh, helping them engender the habits of mind that we want them to cultivate. Yes, sw switching topic a little bit and um, uh, linking to the prior panel with Jessica and Katie. Um, uh, when we think about those tough technologies uh, that, are, that, that Katie was speaking about and the uh, great work that Jessica is working on, uh, on, uh, on AI, um, how can we prepare um, our children for this future? Um, Tom van der Ark has, um, wrote recently that every high school should teach AI in some fashion. Uh, should this be the case? Uh, what are your perspectives on it? Okay, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but fine. Um, I, so I, I actually scribbled down what Katie was talking because I'm one of those former or recovering chemical engineers that she was talking about. And um, I do think that there is, and it, no matter what path our young people choose, I, I agree with Issa's just opening statement um, and the statement about lifelong learning. Like we actually want to prepare students to be able to explore their possibilities. We want them to know who they are, what they know, and be able to do whatever they want to do to change the world, full stop. With that said, I think we owe it to them to prepare them to be able to explore that world in which whatever way they choose. I believe given the advances and where we are in AI in particular, there are some fundamental things that we know young people need, ways in which young people need to be trained. When I, I often uh, go back and, and speak at my College of Engineering, and even though I haven't been a formal engineer since 1990 something, um, I often tell these students what what I actually took away was a way of critical thinking, a way of solving problems, a curiosity to get to root cause. Those are all things that we know young people need formally. So I am, I am adamant and, and quite a fan of saying there are some, ba you know, through certain materials and certain approaches, there are some basic things that we need young people pre-K through 16 to be learning in order to pr be prepared for this next generation. What are you doing at Reading on this uh, topic? Oh, Jeff, yeah, Jeff, question for you. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I mean, I, I think with, uh, with any technology, and AI has become kind of a stand-in for, I think, the word technology generally, uh, one, thing that, one thing that AI doesn't do super well uh, is, is like, it's think. Right? It's pattern matching. We, there's lots of different uh, definitions of, of AI. But really, the, the question is, when, uh, how do we teach kids to be at a level where they can process whatever technological resources are given to them and know how to wade through uh, the questions that resolves? A lot, of it, uh, a lot of it comes down to information is a lot easier to find and a lot harder to parse. Uh, and so it's, much, it's very easy to find a blog post that somebody wrote but figuring out how to validate whether the information in that blog post is true and figuring out where to find the source material, like that's those, a lot of those critical thinking questions are really what it comes down to. And so the more, uh, the more evolved computers become and the more uh, l resources we have at our disposal, the more important it is that we build really good thinkers to know how to leverage those resources. I just, uh, I know I've been talking way up here in systems. If I got really practical really fast and tried to answer that question um, in the K-12 system today, and, uh, and there'll be lots of love and affection in different audiences for this statement, I would blow our schools of education completely up. 
because we're not setting up stage. And it's not because I don't love educators. It's not because I don't think we need to prepare them. It's because I do love educators and we're fundamentally failing in their preparation. So when we want to think about our kids understanding AI, how in the heck are they going to understand AI when, they're, when their teacher in their classroom doesn't? Or their parent, for that matter. And that's not, you know, that's not a criticism. It's just a fact of where we are in, in an evolutionary process around um, where we're headed. And so I do think we've, you know, on a practical level, we have to reconcile the gap. And how we close that gap, I would say there's multiple pathways for closing it. But if we think we're going to solve that problem, sorry, Arthur Levine, wherever he is, um, <laughs> um, actually, he is pushing on this envelope. But at the end of the day, if we think we're going to solve it by our traditional training and PD programs and retraining and PD programs based on the same systems that we're saying we don't want to prepare our kids for, we've just got to, it, it's a, you know, we're, it's a mismatch on a problem and a solution. So I totally agree with that. And I will add <laughs> um, that I think that's why it's so important to um, get familiar with the broader ecosystem. And there are actors, other actors in an ecosystem who are doing this very specific work. So there are a lot of different types of agencies, as we call them, intermediaries, in this space, in this space that are very much focused on pathway development. They're very much attuned to what skills are needed. What are these future skills? What does di digital literacy look like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now? There are organizations out there that are doing this space that are incentivized in very different ways, and they can serve as not only influencers, connectors, conveners, but master negotiators between systems, right? So between employers, between um, post-secondary systems, between K-12 systems, and that's what's gonna be so important in this work is that third, fourth, whatever you wanna call them, actor in this space because, like you said, these, our traditional systems are incentivized in very different ways. It's gonna take some time for them to transform. Um, there's a lot of different competing priorities that are happening at any given time. So how do we look at other actors in this space that are much more nimble, much more flexible, much more entrepreneurial, and they still either touch students directly or indirectly, um, but they have some level of credibility. And I know for us specifically, our early investments in this education and employment space is very much focused on those intermediaries because we know that it's gonna take some time to transform these systems. And so at some point, we're gonna be very intentional about, okay, like what do we need to do within these systems? But while that's happening, we're losing young people along the way, right? Another, another, gra another graduating class is getting past us and they're not ready to launch um, in the workforce, right? And so here we have another class that's either gonna be unemployed or underemployed just because the systems are working against them. So what can we do now given um, what we know exists, and I really do think those intermediaries that folks don't often pay close attention to are critical players, and they are negotiating on behalf of these systems, so we need to really be looking at those types of organizations. Thank you. I have a final and a final question, and it's a little bit of a sh shameless plug um, for full disclosure, uh, given that most of my work is in early childhood. Um, Given all we know about brain science and uh, the learning of si learning science as well, should we start thinking about this much earlier? Should we invest more in the early years? You're going to have a hard time getting people to say no, I think. <laughs> so, Anna, maybe your comments as a yeah from a from a district perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, to your point. I mean, why would I ever say no? Um, the flip side of that coin that I just want to, so the answer is full stop, yes. But I also think um, often we think, and I know this is uh, a little um, elementary to say this, but just to put more money is not going to get us to where we need to go. I mean, universal pre-K, we, we invested millions more in New Mexico in pre-K. I want to be really upfront, and I believed in it. But I also want to say, just as much as we've said everything else, the people matter. What's happening in those spaces and places are super important. And I'm, I am, uh, it's not that I'm anti-investing early and often and, and, and knowing full well that the earlier years matter exponentially in regards to the later years. 
but I also think sometimes we can get on campaigns and say just more money in those early years and we're good. And I, I'm a little, uh, that to me is a pendulum swing that is not nuanced enough for what we know today. Yeah, thank you. I think we have a few, few, few minutes for, for questions. Yep. I'm curious, um, we talked uh, about social capital and the importance of social capital, and I wonder if you comment on what you think are the most promising technology interventions that would assist young people, particularly young people who don't come by uh, a lot of social capital for the accident of birth, in, in fact, building their social capital. So I'll say we're really early in this space in terms of our research, so we're just learning. Um, in like six months, I think that's our timeline, we're gonna start trying to figure out how do we translate our research into actual practice and tools and methodologies and frameworks. I will say <coughs> there are lots of um, like existing technology out there around like Nexus and Aspire. I mean, there's tons of technology out there right now that allow young people to connect with um, professionals in different spaces that they may not naturally be connected with and they have these either moment in time or over a course of a period of time like virtual mentorship like opportunity so there's a lot of that that exists I can't provide one really good solid example of like oh here's a good example of one that exists and and what we've learned in some cases I will tell you and why I think I think there's going to be a lot of growth in that area so what we learned when it comes to strong ties and weak ties when it comes to some of our closest relationships and say there's a job that we want and that person knows someone there. The research shows that sometimes the person closest to us is apprehensive about making that connection because of whatever relationship they have with the other person and they have with us. And you know, if we don't get it, they're, they're closer to the disappointment, so there's higher risk. Where that weak tie is actually much more willing to say, oh yeah, I'll just facilitate an email connection or facilitate a call for you because there's there's a, nothing lost on my end. So there's something about virtual relationships, there's something about not being closely tied to a young person that still provides them the opportunity to just have a greater network and greater influence. So I think when it comes to like virtual mentorship, virtual exposure opportunities, even virtual job shadowing, like a, there are a number of, uh, there's a number of like tools out there to provide virtual you know, job shadowing. I've seen that more less industry-based, I've seen that more employer-based. Um, so that's one space, but I can't speak deeply on it now because we're still in a research phase. Other questions? To take a slightly different um, approach to that, that question, uh, I think about uh, it's very hard to, uh, when I think about what Google and Wikipedia have done in terms of enabling people to go out and find information and make univers information universally accessible, it's very hard from a social capital perspective to compete with somebody's ability to say, well, my doctor told me this or that I don't need this treatment and I'm gonna go look it up and actually see uh, what uh, the internet has to tell me. Um, and I think writing by that same uh, standard, if you wanna help people develop social capital, you have to help them figure out how to communicate, how to make cogent asks, how to articulate their thoughts and their feelings in a way that other people take them seriously and appreciate what they're saying. So some of it is actually just building the skills of networking and of communication to enable them to leverage opportunities when they actually get them. Yeah, I'll say, um, when, when I founded Surge, we looked high and low for lots of uh, technological, like, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so we didn't want to create something that already existed if we could leverage it and bring it into uh, our programming. And we really could not find anything that got to um, these skills around communication and knowing how to navigate. Because social capital isn't just about who you know or who you're connected to. It's knowing how to actually leverage those connections, which requires relationship. So I feel like because of Brian um, Stevenson, folks have been talking about proximity left and right, but they forget that proximity is lost without relationship. Being close to you doesn't make me proximate. Us being in relationship makes me proximate. And that's something, you know, that's something that's hard to take out of the analog world, I think. But I'd love to talk to folks who are doing it so we could learn more at Surge. Thank you. Please join me in thanking uh, this uh, great group of panelists. Thank you.